You can live your best life now. You can have it all. God makes all things work together for the good of everybody. Jesus will make you happy and fix every one of your problems. These are the lies propagated by false teachers of so much of modern evangelical culture. There is a lacking of preaching of hard biblical truths. And this morning we, we confront one of those truths, one of those unpopular truths of the Word of God, one of the unpopular themes of the Word of God. So many of popular evangelical leaders have tried to make Christianity to be a thing where everything is happy, sunshine and rainbows, there is no pain. Unfortunately, what we see in the Scripture is not like that. There is suffering. And that is the theme we'll be look, we will be looking at this morning and in the coming weeks, suffering. Last week we saw how God calls us to conduct ourselves as Christians and how He calls us to respond to our enemies. A call to respond to our, en- to our enemies by forgiving them and blessing them. And this week, we examine the Christian's call to suffering. Suffering is a prominent theme in the book of 1 Peter. If you remember, the believers at this time suffered immense persecution, immense suffering, not only economically from people not wanting to do business for them for their beliefs, but also physically. Should I remind you of Nero and other Roman emperors? How pagan and how corrupt they were. Nero himself tying Christians to stakes, dressing himself up in wild animal clothing, and then jumping on them, attacking them. The believers at this time were facing a type of persecution and a type, enduring types of suffering that the modern American evangelical church has little understanding about. So as we look at 1 Peter chapter 3 this morning, 1 Peter 3, looking at verses 13 through 22 this morning, I want you to examine in the Scripture what it means to suffer for Christ. 1 Peter 3, 13 through 22, says this, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience, so that in the things which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right, rather than doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for the sins once and for all, the just and the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who were, who were once disobedient. When the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water, corresponding to that baptism now saves you, not the, remo- not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who was at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after the angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. This morning we're going to focus on those first nine verses of this, or the the first five verses of this passage. We're going to spend two weeks over this entire last nine verses of 1 Peter 3. And there's a lot 
of truth in here. So let us take our time and let us examine it verse by verse so we can unpack and discover the truth of God's Word. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? Well, what is zealous? What does this word mean? To have zeal. A way of putting it is by saying having great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. To be zealous is to be passionate. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good, if you prove passionate for what is good? Remember, this is following the same thought of how you treat your enemies that we talked about last week. Blessing them and not cursing them. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving blessings instead, saying kind words. Not going on the offensive, but turning the other cheek and forgiving those who have done you wrong. The Apostle Peter here in verse 13 said, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? If you're, you're passionate about doing the right thing, who's there to harm you? He's make the, making this a general statement. In most instances, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, if you're following God as you ought to, in many regards, you shouldn't face a persistent, everyday amount of, of enemies. But, we see in verse 14, even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation. You do not be troubled. But even if you should, it's not, persecution is not something that is necessarily ordinary, but even if you do go through it, and it says that you will in the Scripture. Even though it's not an everyday thing, even though there's just moments of it, even though you're to suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. This type of suffering, and there's many types of suffering, but this distinct type of suffering we're examining this morning is the suffering that happens as a result of other people doing things to you. This isn't a type of suffering that's internal internal or external with your, your body, any kind of pain in that regard, but it regards dealing with others and how others deal with you. You suffer against exterior forces, but as you, ex as you suffer against these exterior forces, as these enemies who come after you and persecute you and treat you wrong, remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets, who were before you. What was that? Matthew what? Matthew 5, 10 through 12. I'll read it again. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus is saying, those of you who are persecuted, those of you who are facing the mistreatment of enemies, remember, this has happened to all those who have been faithful before you. You are not the first to endure this. But know that you're blessed. Know that you have a great reward ahead of you in heaven. In a practical sense, it is much easier to deal with suffering if you know the promises of God. 
knowing the promises of God and believing in Him will help you endure your suffering. And we do know that we need to abide in Christ. And endurance is necessary for us to do so. And we see that suffering is something that produces endurance and ability for us to abide in Christ. There's a certain way that suffering works for our good. How God uses it for our good. In James 1, 2 through 4, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Consider it joy. When's the last time you've considered someone being mean to you? Someone attacking you for your faith as joy. When's the last time you viewed yourself when you're standing for Christ? You viewed yourself as blessed when people attack you. Have you remembered that? Have you considered it joy? Do. Think of it this way. Because if you're, if you're facing enemies for Christ's sake, if they're coming at you and attacking you for your faith, you're doing something right. Believer, know that when you suffer, not only is God honored, but God is using the suffering you face to help you grow you in your faith to greater levels of dependence upon Him. We've been called to suffer. Do you remember 1 Peter 2, 21? Wherein it says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you to follow in His footsteps. Christ suffered. And we are to suffer as well. Not in such a way where we purposely just look for ways to suffer or ways to harm ourselves or cause ourselves pain. But we should be willing to endure suffering. Persecution. We should be willing to endure the harsh words, the mean things that people throw at us. All the sticks and the stones that they try to break your bones with. Their words shouldn't hurt you. You should consider it all joy. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation. And do not be troubled. Christian, there is nothing you should fear in this life. There's only one thing that you really should fear. And it goes beyond this life. Your fear should be in the living God. A reverence, an honor. You have nothing to fear. Not even your your greatest physical fears. Not a snake. Not a brown bear. Not being sick. Nothing. No fear should overtake you. Especially not the ones that are brought upon you by other people. Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill your body. Fear the one who can kill the body and throw your soul in hell. He is the only one to fear, the only one that we should really care who, about what, who thinks about us, care about what he thinks. Everyone in the world could hate you, but if God loves you and you're on God's side, you're in the right place. Do not fear their intimidation. Do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness 
and reverence. But sanctify. What does this word sanctify mean? The word sanctify in this, in this sense means to set apart. In other passages, it means to make holy. But to set apart. Set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. In other words, you can think of it like this, to set apart in your hearts Christ as Lord. Apart from everything else, put Christ where He belongs, on the throne, at a place of lordship, and yourself in a place of servitude and submission. As He is the King of kings and He is the Lord of lords, and it is an honor for you to merely be a servant. For who are we but creatures that were made out of the dust who have rebelled against God? Yet He has been so gracious to us to not only reconcile us and want to bring us, bring him, bring us back to Him, but use us for His own glory. To let us have a part in this life. To let us play the game of life. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. A defense or argument. That's what this is. Be ready to give a defense. Be ready to give an argument. Be ready to engage in a healthy dialogue or debate with those who ask. Dare I say, even with those who don't ask. As we are, are to preach Christ even through our conversations, through our words, Oh, that we would be more heavenly minded. Oh, that we would look at each other and, and think of that person's soul. And keep in mind that person who you're looking at is either going to heaven or they're going to hell. If you looked at every person like that, how would your conversations change? All of a sudden the weather doesn't come so important. Unless it's tornado season or extreme flooding like it was this last weekend. Be ready to give a defense, debate, an argument, a dialogue. In order to do this, in order to be able to give a healthy dialogue and debate and show your reasonings for your, your hope in Christ, what must you do? You must be prepared. Not one of the presidential candidates, although you may think so if you've been watching the Democratic debates, just go up without preparing. Everyone knows when they go up to a debate what they're going to say. They know their positions. They have facts. They've ingrained in themselves. They know what they are going to say. What about you, Christian? When somebody asks you for your reasoning for your hope, why you believe in Christ, what do you say? Do you know enough of the Word of God to provide evidence for your hope? In order to be prepared, we must be students. We must be students of the Word of God. Not only for our own sanctification, but for, the, for others as well. So that others may come to an understanding and a knowledge of the truth. And how is it that we give this account, this, offense, this defense? How do we give it? With gentleness and reverence. A gentleness, not, 
Not a bull in the china cabinet. Not an elephant in the grocery store approach. But with gentleness, meekness, and reverence. Revering the other person. Holding that other person that you're talking to in respect and honor. The way that you show another person honor and reverence speaks a lot about how you give reverence and honor to God. Just a little side note about this gentleness and reverence. I'm taking a class this week, and we've been studying first, our First Amendment right to speech. And the professor pulled up a video of this well-known group of people. Perhaps you've heard of the Westboro Baptist Church. If you don't, it's a self-proclaimed church, just a group of people, mostly from the same family, who I don't see how they adhere to Baptist doctrine. They don't preach the gospel. But what they do do is they go and they pick it. Funerals of fallen soldiers. They stand outside and they throw all kinds of obscenities along with saying that everyone is going to hell without offering any grace, without offering any love and respect. They have no gentleness and they have no reverence. And as we watch these we watched that video, I looked around the classroom and I could just see the amount of stumbling blocks these people were causing. The amount of walls they were putting up between a non-believer and the ability to believe. Like speed bumps on the road. So now every time someone goes to one of those individuals in the classroom and goes to say, here's the gospel. Immediately, that person's going to think, oh, you're one of those religious nuts. We are not to be this way. We are not to be Westboro Baptist-like. We're to be gentle and revering with other people. And what happens when we do so? When we, we speak and deliver our, our account with with gentleness and reverence and keep a good conscience the thing which we are slandered and those who revile our good behavior will be put to shame that is what happens so verse 16 says and keep a good conscience so that in the thing which you are slandered those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame by you keeping a good conscience, by you walking in a righteous path, and beyond that, when you do slip up, that you do confess it to your Father, that you go right to God. You don't try to hide your sins. You don't try to hide your shortcomings from God. Adam and Eve tried that. We know how that went down. God found them. God knows your thoughts. God knows your heart. There is no hide and seek with God. He knows where you are. He knows where your heart is. He knows what your treasure is. So treasure Him. Confess to Him. Return to Him. Each and every time you fall short of His glory. That allows you to have a good conscience. And so when the people do slander you and they attack you, for following Christ, those who say that you, you do strange things, that you act in a way that is different from the world, their behavior is put to shame. You think uh, about, in context, what this looked like. The believers at that time were very misunderstood, as Christianity was just viewed as a sect of Judaism. They were different. People saw the Christians as cannibals because they 
ate and drank the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ. When every time they took communion, people thought that they were acting like they were eat, eating Jesus' actual flesh. Not only that, the believers also called each other brother and sister and were intermarrying. So they were looked in that way as morally corrupt, as defiled, as strange. And so they were slandered, so they were attacked for this because the, the world at that time didn't understand. So when Peter's encouraging them to have good behavior, have this good conscience, so that the other people will be put to shame by the things that they're accusing you of. Verse 17, For it is better if God should will it that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. And you think about this, it makes sense. What honor is there in committing a crime and going to prison for it? There's none. But if you go to prison for something that you didn't do, for a crime you didn't commit, is there more honor in that? Surely. Surely God can use both people. The person who has been thrown in prison for a crime they've committed and a person who was unjustly accused and unjustly placed in prison. However, God is honored in a greater fashion, in a greater way, when we obey Him, when we do not do the things that displease Him and that would lead us to shame, but let us be reviled, let us be attacked for our good works, for the things that we do. Let people say, oh, that good work they did is just for attention. Oh, those things that they're doing, you know, they're, they're just up to no good. There's some kind of ulterior motive. No. Let us continue in our good works. A great example of these things is in Acts chapter 4. And I want to read you the story of Peter and John as they go and they testify before the high council in Jerusalem. At this time, Pentecost has happened. People are coming to faith quickly. Some of the greatest sermons in history are being preached. Miracles are happening. The Spirit is moving. And the Jews who had thought that the end of this Jesus movement was over after they killed Christ. All of a sudden they see all these people leaving the Jewish faith and joining these Christians and they don't know what's going on. And so they go and they bring Peter and John for the council. Let us examine how they give reason and account for the things that have happened. Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 1. As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem, and Ananias the high priest was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. And they had placed them in the center and began to inquire, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ uh, the Nazarene, 
whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by his name this man stands before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other, there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. What a strong testimony. What a strong statement. Do you see how Peter gives that explanation for his hope in Christ? Testifying to what has happened, the miracle that has happened as a result of what Christ has done for this man. And that Christ had risen from the dead. Standing there in their face saying, There is salvation in no one else whom you crucified. That very person was the Messiah. Peter hit them with Scripture. He made his argument with the Word of God. Not with his own ideas, not trying to come up with some kind of intelligent metaphor or simile. Trying to overtake them by facts and logic. He preached the Word of God. Continuing in the story with verse 13, it says, Now they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were amazed, and they began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with him, and they had nothing to say in reply, but they had ordered them to leave the council. And they began to confer with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread among any but so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give you heed, give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. When they had, been threat when they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them, on account of the people, for they were all glorifying God for what had been done. For the man was more than forty years old on whom this miracle had been performed. Peter and John set apart Christ as Lord in their hearts, and they were ready to make this defense. We should strive to emulate this. We should study diligently. We should spend time with God so that we are able to proclaim this hope. Proclaim salvation through the only one who gives it. Through God. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see how they, you see how they suffered? Do you see how Peter and John suffered? Verse 17 says, For it's better that if God should will it that you suffer for doing what is right than doing what is wrong. They were thrown in prison and to stay overnight. It would get much worse for them. John would be exiled to an island. Peter would be crucified upside down. They suffered. Do not think that you were the first of God's chosen people to suffer. Consider Joseph. His brother sold him into slavery. He was falsely accused of rape. He was left in prison and nearly forgotten about until God's appointed time for him to interpret Pharaoh's dream. Have you considered the Israelites who were enslaved for over 400 years? God's own people were dying under the yoke of slavery. Noah had to build an ark for a hundred years. We get tired of doing the same thing after four hours. 
David was in hiding. Eli's sons died. Jeremiah preached and few listened. And he watched the temple be destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Stephen was martyred. Legend has it that all the apostles died for the faith. What makes you any different? Why should we aim for anything less than to suffer? Not to inflict suffering upon ourselves, but for the but may we be glorified. May we be honored by the privilege that we have to suffer for Christ, just as these great men of faith have. But why did they do it to begin with? And why should we do it? Why? Why is it better if God sh should so will it that we suffer for doing what is right rather than what is evil? It's because of what Christ has done for you. Look at verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that He might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. For Christ also died for sins once for all. Christ also died. Christ's suffering went beyond anything that we can imagine. The most excruciating of pain. Have you ever had a crown of thorns on your head? Have you ever had to bear a cross multiple miles? Have you ever had 39 lashes with a whip with rocks and bones ingrained into it, with your flesh being ripped open. Tremendous amount of suffering, tremendous amount of pain, all the way to death. For what? For you. For this world. So that He might bring us back to God. He is the just for the unjust. He who had no sin came sin for us. He took it on. He bore the pain, the entire weight of it. That He might bring us back to God. This whole process of reconciliation. Christ died to bring us back to our Maker. To bring humanity back to its Maker. Colossians 1.22 says, Yet He has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless beyond reproach. He's brought us back to him. God does not want you far off, believer. Spend time with him. Spend time with him. If you belong to him now, it's all the easier. If you believed in him the first time, you're not far off. The Spirit lives inside of you. Do not neglect your time with God as it pleases Him to have that communion. He reconciled you back for communion, for fellowship. That is God's desire. He didn't need it, but He created us for it. And He desires our relationship. He desires a relationship with us. Having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Jesus was fully man and fully God. His humanity died, but He's made alive in the Spirit. He was resurrected from the dead. He lives. He's vindicated. This is the truth. This is what we put our hope in. This is what we confess with our mouth, and this is what we believe in our heart, that Jesus Christ has been resurrected from the dead. Though your body will return to the dirt, your soul will live forever, believer, if you so dare to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. May we all repent of our sins and turn to Christ to be saved from the wrath of God if we have not already.
For truly it is the kindness of God that brings us to repentance. It is the kindness of God that desired reconciliation. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the truth of your gospel. Jesus Christ, when we consider what you've done, we're in awe. We're so thankful. Lord, we lift you up. We place you on your throne as you deserve. In our hearts, Lord, we bow before you. Mold us into the men and the women you need us to be. Lord, use us. Lord, though we may face external threats, though people may come after us and cause suffering and and pain in our lives, though we may be persecuted, God, may we do what is right in your sight and be honored. Lord, may we keep in mind your promises. May we remember that you have put before us an imperishable inheritance. May we long for it. May we be eternally minded, not just thinking about the here and now. But Lord, may we consider the soul of each person we come in contact with and know that you died to reconcile them back to yourself. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name.